The Lyrics New York is Rem Kaur's manifesto of a richer, active utopia, consisting of discussions on Manhattan's organizational structures and the benefits that come along with the cultures of congestion. Kaur has several takes on hyper-dense city structures, such as skyscrapers and the development of the grid. Rem Kaur graduated from the Architectural Association in London. Later, he founded Alma. In 1975, with Elia and Zoe Zangelis, and met Long Fierzendorf. In 1978, Quas published *The Lyrics New York: A Retroactive Manifesto for Manhattan*. In *The Lyrics New York*, Quas glorifies the utilitarian organization central to Manhattanism and culture of congestion, to the point of overlooking their negative effects on city life. Henry Hudson found Manhattan in 1609. Years later, 30 Dutch families sailed here to achieve colonization. By 1626, Peter Minuit purchased Manhattan from the indigenous group. Kuas uses an arrogant tone when talking about the colony. From his perspective, Manhattan never belonged to the indigenous communities, and the colony was a great initiative, bringing the light of civilization, commerce. And intelligence to the barbaric place. He believed North American barbarism was to give place to European refinement. Nevertheless, the colony was not successful, and the foundation of New York was determined. Dutch managed Manhattan in the European style. They built a walled city with a canal towards the center, plus traditional Dutch buildings along the streets, just like Amsterdam. This kind of neat, symmetrical urban planning was not suitable for the mountainous region of Manhattan. Consequently, such Dutch influence leads to the further grid system. A term that is central to the book is the concept of the grid. Kuas describes it as a conceptual speculation. However, more literally, it is a collection of 2,028 defined blocks. With examples of a block being Coney Island or Rockefeller Center. In Delirious New York, Quas persists that the grid perceived rationality as well as its indifference to topography. This is a case for what he calls the superiority of mental construction over reality. After all, he himself admits that the objective of the grid is to subjugate. And even obliterate nature. Guas claims the strict organization of the grid allows for rigid chaos, variability in the third dimension, but also in city life. He hints at the link between space and congestion. An open park has little possibility of congestion, even with large crowds. Essentially, the grid is a filter. That traps crowds and creates congestion. Manhattan is the archetype of a metropolis, and the two concepts are often interchangeable. The spectacular rise of Manhattan coincided with the metropolis's own definition of the concept, presenting the ultimate ideal of density in terms of both population and urban amenities. Architecture promotes crowding on every possible level, while its exploration of crowding inspires and supports a particular form of social interaction. All these forms of interaction combine to create a unique, crowded culture. In 1807, the neat grid was created. It was a product of pure instrumental rationality that sacrificed fairness to beauty. It was unusual in several ways. First, he could not foresee what kind of inhabitants and city life would be placed there. Also, it does not predict the future of the city, but just stretches it in every possible direction, and it does not specify the function and image of each block. But the spatial relationship of each block is uniform. Manhattan's urban culture is not highbrow sensibility in theory. It's the compromise of what Coolhouse calls a neutral system, and New York is the perfect vehicle for it. New York is a new world city without any cultural burden, which can mix various cultural elements. Also, Manhattan is geographically self-sufficient unit of landscape, climate, and culture that makes possible a one-off reinvention of the world. 
New York is a place where private interests are paramount, where real estate and business ventures completely dominate. It seems that the paradigm of a traditional city has been completely abandoned and the signal of the death of a traditional city has been seen. However, the city did not really die and the urbanists in the traditional sense still ran and appealed for the revival of the city. At that time, the cities around the world were in a crisis of disintegration and most of the high density Western cities were now facing the problem caused by the loss of a number of people due to suburban style living. So-called fringe cities can be found in the suburbs of Paris, Atlanta, or Tokyo, where the rise of suburban-style office, shopping, residential, and even entertainment complexes has eroded the meaning of the downtown area. Jane Jacobs' book, The Life and Death of Great American Cities, clearly witnesses the crisis rather than the hope of crowded culture in traditional cities. While Cool House's goal was to update modernist urban theory his solution was to make peace with the two aesthetics represented by commercial architects and elite European modernizers, rather than completely demolish it. Coolhouse defines the culture of congestion as a new cultural paradigm at the antithesis of sprawl celebrating density, heterogeneity, and the vertical dynamism associated with the modern city and its horizontal grid. Manhattan's grid plan is limited to creative spatial composition before steel frames and elevators are introduced. However, in the early 20th century, a famous quote, eating oyster with boxing gloves naked on the ninth floor, becomes a social phenomenon due to the in internal programmatic logic of skyscrapers. Coolhouse also examines the new Babylonian ideal that promotes cultural congestion and binary plots that intensify human interaction. Though what it really reflects is a chaotic, hyper-dense, and overwhelmed industrial hybrid of structures. The pra pragmatic concerns of such vehicular congestion include pollution, infrastructure, maintenance, and physiological impacts. Although a lot of Coolhouse's ideas come with disagreements, parts of his proposal are logical and convincing. A grid plan to the streets of Manhattan is vital to its identity as it provides a rationality to the irrational elements of the city. The grid sets a rule and pattern for the chaotic architecture in New York, giving it a counterpoint to the city's disorder. After Delirious New York was published, reviews of the book were written in response to Coolhouse's ideas. In the review, He'll Take Manhattan by Paul Goldberger, agreements and critiques were made on Coolhouse's ideas. The main criticism Goldberger made was the fact that Coolhouse has ignored the negative effects of congestion on the poor and misinterpreted the meaning of technology on the form of city. In this case, because congestion massively increases the population density in a fixed land area, people of different classes are forced to emerge together in the same community, which means that the poor live the same lifestyle as the rich and pay equal amounts for the activities. Hence, the higher level of expenses makes the poor struggle while the rich continue to thrive. Coolhouse also believed in density to achieve vitality. However, Goldberger criticized the unnecessary congestion that urban cities like Houston and Los Angeles have established for vitality without congestion. The idea of cultural congestion ignores the development of technology, that people do not have to live next to each other to communicate anymore. However, despite the disagreements to Coolhouse's words, Goldberger points out that the images and illustrations of congested New York are far more convincing and beautiful than Coolhouse's words to describe it. Overall, reviews at the time have doubted many points made by Coolhouse in the book and agreed with parts of the proposal as well. However, there is a general rebuttal towards Coolhouse's idea of congestion and his irrational view of New York's future. Since publishing the book, Coolhouse's views have changed. In a recent interview, Rem Coolhouse was asked by Dr. Nicholas Mack, a German architectural journalist, how somebody who wrote Delirious New York and propagated a culture of congestion and multi-layered cities became interested in the seemingly opposite of the city. Coolhouse replied, Well, I think that uh, uh, I basically became kind of aware that, that uh, as urban citizens, uh, we increasingly have a kind of very little sense of agency. 